everybody. Uh, podiums freak me out, so I'm going to stand over here. Uh, like, like Chris said, my name is David Pierce. I'm the editor at large at The Verge. Uh, we're very happy you're all here. This is really exciting. It's cold and there's football, so the idea that anyone is here at all is, is very exciting. We're very grateful you're here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is going to be awesome. We have a whole afternoon and evening full of fun stuff. We're going to play video games. We're going to talk about social media. We're going to talk about the future of life and everything. It's going to be great. Um, the one thing I will say is that uh, you should buy my guest's book. He's going he's gonna to be very nice about himself, but it's very good, and he uh, is going to sign it later. It's very good. Anyway, we're going to get into all of this. Right now, you don't need to hear me talk anymore. So welcome out Max Fisher. He's a New York Times reporter and the author of the book, The Chaos Machine. Welcome, Max. Hi. Hey. Thank you for doing this. This is the perfect time to do this. I realized this coming in today. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's not been paying attention, uh, Meta just laid off 11,000 people and is basically like running away from the whole idea of social media trying to make the metaverse a thing. Elon Musk bought Twitter and that's that. I heard about that. <laughs> it's just, I've run out of adjectives to describe what's happening there. Uh, TikTok is, is blowing up, YouTube is blowing up, everything feels like it's shifting all at once, social media is everything and we're gonna get into a lot of that over the course of this afternoon. But the thing that I loved about your book, and so the place I wanna start, is you do a really good job of basically describing what it is about us as people that makes us so susceptible to what social media does. And I agree with a lot of your book, I disagree with some stuff, we're gonna get into all of it, it's gonna be really interesting. But the first thing I wanna do is talk about kind of what we are as people mm -hmm. that makes all of this work. And the first thing I want to do is I want you to tell us the story about foxes that's in your book. This is a strange place to start, but go with us. Uh, it, it all comes back around, I promise. Uh, but that was one of the things that jumped out to me the most in reading the book that felt like sort of a perfect microcosm of the whole thing. So can you just tell all of us the story of the foxes? Yes, I'm so glad that we are starting with this. So just to warn everyone, like you said, this is not something that is initially going to sound like it's a story about social media. I promise it becomes a story about <laughs> social media and how it affects us, how it changes. It's gonna sound at first like it's a story about an old Soviet lady in Siberia hanging out with a bunch of foxes, because it is. So It is exactly that yeah, story. Yeah. That's right. So in the 1950s, there was this Soviet geneticist named Lyud Molotrat who wanted to discover this mystery that had been the heart of genetics going back to Darwin, which is what if anything, is the genetic basis for the domestication of animals. What's, what, is there a genetic reason that domesticated dogs are different from wolves, horses, cows? Is there a reason that they all have common physical traits, like they have floppier ears, they have flatter faces, they have smaller heads, what's going on here? And trying to understand what are the origins of that. So in the 1950s, it was actually illegal to study genetics in the Soviet Union for weird political reasons. So, Lyud Militrat to study this to try to understand what are the origins of domestication. She took over part of a, uh, a fur farm in way in the middle of nowhere in Siberia that bred foxes for fur coats. And what she did was she said she was gonna do this experiment that she knew at the outset was going to take 50 years, and it did take 50 years, to breed one generation of foxes after another by taking the 10% friendliest foxes out of any generation and just breeding those. And she, what she hoped was that over many generations of this, eventually they would domesticate and that would allow her to identify what caused this. And sure enough, after many, many years of doing this, what a great job, by the way, just to hang out with foxes all the time. I think it sounds awesome. But only the nice ones, too. Only, that's like, right, yeah, only, all the other ones. only the friendly yeah. ones, yeah. Um, what she did in fact find was that there was a moment when suddenly they domesticated and she was able to isolate down a specific biological, chemical, physical change that happened in the foxes. Which there's this specific kind of cell that develops in utero that was being suppressed. There's a specific set of hormones that were being suppressed and that led to the foxes being much friendlier, much more cooperative, much more social, much more able to be around each other, less aggressive, and then also having these physical changes. And what was interesting about this and what made this discovery like one of the biggest discoveries like in all of science, I think in the last 50, 60 years, was that the physical markers that she found happened to line up perfectly, just identical match to a set of changes in us, in humanity, that happened just as we became homo sapiens 250,000 years ago, where 
at that moment we transitioned from living in very small groups to living in suddenly much larger groups of like 100, 150, suddenly dominating our environment, being much smarter, that we had the same change that happened in domesticated animals. So that opened up this mystery, how did we domesticate? Because with the foxes, with every other animal, there's a person there to intervene to artificially promote these friendlier animals that were not going to reproduce so successfully anyway. But as best we know, 250,000 years ago, there was not a Soviet geneticist running around selecting for the nicer people on the step and, and putting down the less nice ones. So that opened up this whole second journey, and I will spare you the details of how they finally got to the answer to this, but working with this English anthropologist named Richard Wrangham, she finally figured out that what had happened 250,000 years ago was that we developed language. And what developing language allowed us to do was to overturn the social order that had dominated in our species and in predecessor species for like 10 million years, which is alpha males dominate the group, which is a small number of males who are the most aggressive, the most violent, the most domineering, that they control the group, they are the ones that reproduce, no one else does. And what had happened with the development of language was that all of the other males, the beta males, were able to get together, were able to say, this sucks, <laughs> we don't care for this, and what we're going to do is because we have strength in numbers and we have the ability to coordinate now with language, we're going to overturn the alpha males, and we're going to impose this new order where we rule collectively through consensus. And this was turned out to be an identical process to what Leod Militrat was doing with the foxes, which it was selecting at a genetic level for friendliness, for cooperation, it was also selecting for conformity, for a willingness to go along with the group, and crucially, and this is where I promise we're getting closer to social media, selecting for a propensity and a willingness and even a drive to commit basically violence on behalf of a group against someone who is a moral or social transgressor, someone who is a bully, who is an alpha male, who was pushing around the rest of the group, who the group didn't like, because what had to happen when you overturn the alpha male, now you have to enforce this new order. Now you have to enforce what Richard Wrangham, the anthropologist who worked on this, he called it proactive coalitional aggression, which is a fancy way of saying a lot of people coming together as a group and deciding to commit some sort of violence on behalf of the group. This philosopher named Ernst Gellner had a, a more fun name for it. He called it the tyranny of cousins. This is something you still see in uh, hunter-gatherer societies today where basically the, the beta males or all of the males in the group get together and they decide what the norms of the group are and they enforce it collectively through consensus. And we have another name for it which is a mob mentality. And this, this instinct, this behavior that turned us into homo sapiens and that was selected into us over 250,000 years, this is the foundation of who we are as a species, literally the thing that turned us into the human animal. And uh, what is important to understanding about this is the set of behaviors, instincts that this ingrained into us and that made us many of our deepest instincts. One of them is moral outrage. Moral outrage is the trigger for this aggression. It's how all of the beta males come together. It's how you enforce the tyranny because it's how you enforce these social norms, as you say, there's someone who's transgressed in the group and we're gonna go out and we're gonna get them. It creates these conformity impulses, this idea that if your community believes something, you start to believe it too because that has been bred into you over 250,000 years. The way that your brain works is to reproduce this thing that was happening you know, on the East African steppe that turned us into the species that we are. And how this brings us now, finally, to social media is that what happens after 25,000 generations of this, is a bunch of companies come along and they develop technology that does a lot of things, but one of the most important things that it does is that it uses, I mean, first of all, it severely heightens our sense of being in a social group, in a social dynamic, our sense that we are experiencing things socially through that, that kind of group behavior is, is just supercharging everything on it. But the more important thing that it does is that it conducts billions of experiments a day on all of us and anyone who is on the platform to determine what is the precise combination and sequence of emotions, of language, because remember language was the thing that triggered this in the first place, of uh, social stimulus that is going to be most engaging to us. 
And we know, and we know from also lots of social science research that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years, that the thing that is most engaging to us is anything that hits on this impulse that we have for this tyranny of the cousins, for this mob mentality, because that is so deep in us. And I know you have a lot of questions about what that actually means about social media, but I think the thing that is really important to understand is the moral outrage that you encounter so much online in the sense that we are outraged as a group, there's someone who's a transgressor, there's someone who is doing something that we don't like, and we're all going to yell at them, we're gonna punish them, we're gonna get upset about it. When you see that happening on social media, it's not just that outrage happens to be a particularly stimulating emotion, it is the most stimulating emotion, and that is because it is something that goes to the core of who we are as a species. And when you see people acting on that, you are seeing that instinct that is so deeply ingrained within us that has been brought out by these social platforms and amplified on a scale that is entirely new in the human experience. Well, and I think there's something crucial there that I just wanna press on a little further, which is the mm -hmm. difference between regular outrage and moral outrage. Because it's like, it is a truism of the internet that everybody's mad all the time, right? right. And everybody's mad that like, they got bad service at Starbucks. Uh, and they're mad that like their shoes were smaller than advertised on Amazon. But this this thing you're describing, this like more more sort of effective thing, is yeah. moral outrage. Like right. just sort of paint the difference between outrage and moral outrage. Sure. So moral outrage is anger that you feel on behalf of your community against a social transgression, against someone who is doing something to transgress against the group. The most basic way is is you see someone cutting online and you get upset and you wanna say, hey, don't cut online, don't be a jerk, that's moral outrage. And when you see someone else expressing moral outrage, that is something that taps into this instinct that makes you, first of all, pay a lot more attention because it is, it is the social impulse that allowed us to survive as a species. So it's something that is just hardwired into our brain. There, actually, there's this fascinating experiment where these researchers to try to test like, okay, is moral outrage actually the most engaging form of sentiment? Because there's a lot of reason to think it is, but how can we know that for sure? Is they would run these screens in front of people, they would flash all of these different words at them, and they found that no matter what kind of emotional valence was in those words, if it was a sad word, a happy word, an exciting word, that it was the moral outrage words that if it appeared anywhere on the screen, people's eyes would just dart to it before their brain could even process it. Even compared to exciting words like explosion or car wreck, if it was something that, you know, um, liar, cheater, anything that tapped into this sense of someone who is transgressing against the moral norms of the group, that it just grabs your attention more than anything else. And sure enough, on social media, that is what the systems learn to promote above all else, not just because it captures our attention, but because it spurs us to action more, literally more than any other emotion. It makes us want to go along and to get outraged too and the platforms love that because it means now you're not just spending more time browsing, you're posting content yourself that spreads that moral outrage that will get other people to post back. So I told you it came back around, by the way. <laughs> good work, it, it came back around, we yeah. got there. Um, the, that was the thing that was so striking to me in reading your book, was that it's, it's the internet, as we all know, uh, promotes being mad about things mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons that we can get into if you want, but I think most of us sort of feel instinctively like that is, that is how it works. Uh, and it also promotes this constant feeling of identity, right? Like you're, you're yeah. in a place where everything is about attaching you to some mm -hmm. group. Like I remember the Jonah Peretti, the CEO of BuzzFeed used to talk about this, that it was like all those quizzes that were like 11 signs that you're from the Midwest or like pick a breakfast food and we'll tell you where, we're fr where you're from. Like that's about identity, right? And it's about right. telling you where you're from. And if you put those two things together, mm -hmm. it, like, it becomes explosive in, in like really sort of literal ways. And it feels like so much of the bad stuff that we talk about on social media is the connection of those two things. It's, it's when mm -hmm. people have an excuse to be mad about something and a group that they feel a part of that they are protecting or caring for or sort of acting on behalf of. Mm -hmm. and like just thinking about it through that frame, all kinds of things about kind of how social media started to make sense to me. Right, and there's, there's, I think a lot about specifically two of the communities that were two of the biggest early adopters of social media and that I think exemplify this really well. The first are gamers 
and you know, of course, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with Gamergate and what happened with gamer culture online, but the one that I actually think is much more interesting, much more illustrative, is the other big community that was a really early adopter of social media were new mothers. Young moms in the like early 2010s, late 2000s were some of the first people to spend a lot of time on social media. And I think this is a group that really shows this process of identity activation, really radicalization really well, because what the platforms learned is that if you are, say, a new mother going on Facebook, going on Facebook groups because you have questions about your baby or you know, you're trying to deal with a lot of crying, or you're trying to deal with bedtime, whatever, you just go on and ask questions on a group, you're only gonna spend so much time there because you, know, you log on, browse for a little bit, you get your questions answered, you log off. But what the systems learned, and not just on Facebook, I'm not just picking on them, but Facebook is a good way to show this, the group system learned is that people would spend so much more time, these moms would spend so much more time in these groups, if the groups could identify, start them, get them to start thinking about their identity as moms as a group identity, as we are moms as a collective, that is something that really makes people excited about spending more time online and feel this sense of identification with other people on there. Now on its own, of course, that's great, you know, having having an identity as moms is a wonderful thing, but the way to activate that identity that is the most powerful and therefore what the platforms leaned into is a sense of identity threat, is telling moms on Facebook groups, you collectively, not just individually, but collectively moms are under attack in America. And one of the first things that the group's recommendation algorithm really leaned into in trying to convey this to moms because that was the thing that would get them to spend instead of 10 minutes on a Facebook group for moms to spend three hours on it was medical misinformation, was promoting the idea that your doctor actually is imperiling your child and actually those vaccines that they are giving your baby are actually really dangerous or we're just asking questions. We're not sure if they're safe. Are they safe? Maybe they're not safe. Maybe you should spend some more time in this group talking to other moms about how alarmed you are on behalf of mothers about what these doctors are doing. We don't know. And all of a sudden you get the genesis of what we now know as the global anti-vaccine movement. Maybe not the genesis, maybe that's, that's putting it too far. That was, of course, it was around before Facebook, but that is when it starts to explode as a movement and become, you know, 100x times larger. Well, A, as someone who's just about to become a parent for the first time, that's super cool and exciting. Really awesome, glad to hear that. Uh, this will <laughs> be great. Um, but you, you just brought up one of the things I really wanna talk about, which is, I think, a, a sort of theme in your book and a question I think a lot of people are wrestling with, and I think you, you were too in, in writing this, which is basically like correlation versus causation, right? And, sure. and one of these sort of ongoing questions about the internet is like, is, is social media, like are the problems with social media just the problems with people? Mm -hmm. and, and the only difference is that we see them now, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the kind of thing that technology isn't bad, we are bad, and so that's the problem, right? But then I think there are questions about things like the, the anti-vax groups, the example is a good one, and there's a whole story in your book about basically uh, people being sort of systematically guided towards those groups. Mm -hmm. And part of me wonders if that is, if those two things we can prove are related, like mm -hmm. is, is the act of promoting an anti-vaccine group to me actually working towards making me more of an anti-vax person? Right. Um, and my sense is the the truth is probably somewhere in the middle that like we are the problem, but also so are these systems. Like, did you did you land on one side or the other of that spectrum over time? I think that's that's a really smart thing that you're putting your finger on. I think, which is that there's no way to explain the negative effects of social media without also talking about it as really severe human frailties. And a lot of this is us. A lot of it is uh, our cognitive weak points that are getting exploited and that Facebook didn't put there. Um, a lot of it is uh, social fissures that existed before social media, but that the platforms, and by the platforms, I mean the automated systems, not the people running it, learned could be heightened in ways that were gonna be really stimulating to users. And you know, the question of how you assign blame for that is, is a tough one, it goes around. Um, Two studies that I think about a lot in terms of um, nailing down the kind of effect of this, because correlation versus causation, that was a big question I had going into this. How, how do we really know that it's not just that 
you know, assholes like to spend more time on their computers anyway. So maybe that's what's going on. Well, and I think um, a big case you can make is that the, the only difference is scale, right? That all of a sudden, the only thing sure. that really changed is all of a sudden, millions of people now have access to millions of people, which has just never right. happened before. Right. So it's like, is there is there something about the sort of nature of these systems that is fundamentally mm -hmm. different? Or is it literally just that we have never been connected at this scale right. before? Right. I mean, it is... I, I will answer your question, but I think the scale is actually one of the most important manipulative parts of social media. And it's not, it's hard to say like Mark Zuckerberg is bad because he connected us to more people than ever before, because obviously that creates a lot of good things too, but we are not evolved to be in a community of 10 million people. We're, our brains are evolved to be in communities of 100, 150 people at any given time. Now, the world we live in, we're in much larger communities, but the fact that you can go online on Twitter and Facebook at any given moment and get social feedback from 1,000 people, which was never possible for the vast majority of us unless we're rock stars before social media, means that all of our frailties, impulses, instincts have suddenly gotten heightened way out of control. Okay, now to actually answer your question, one of the studies that I think about a lot tracked or researchers got a bunch of people together and they surveyed all the people in the study before it took place for their innate level of outrage. How prone were they as people to experiencing internally or externally expressing outrage? And then they put all of these people or they put a subset of these people, the experimental group, in a fake Twitter platform that looked like Twitter, but that they could control so that they could manage the experience for them. And they had a subset of those send fake tweets that had moral outrage somewhere in it. And even if the people who were sending it didn't want to, it wouldn't be something to do with sending it, you, know, you have to, you have to send a moral outrage sheet. And then they would show them back to them with a lot of engagement, which is something that we know from a lot of other research you are gonna get because the platforms artificially identify and promote anything with a lot of moral outrage in it. They would show those back to them, say, look, you got all this engagement on your tweet with moral outrage, do you wanna send another? And they would run several cycles of this and they found two things. One, the people who they put through this experiment, even if they were not prone to outrage beforehand, suddenly would become much likelier to send tweets with outrage in it because of course they had seen the social rewards they had gotten for sending it. But the second part, the really important part, was that those people who went through that experiment became more prone to feeling outrage as a person internally, even when they were away from their computer. And this is a finding that is shocking in tech, the idea that your social media platform is training you to the extent of changing your underlying nature. But in social psychology, it's completely uncontroversial. The idea that when you get a lot of social feedback from your community, you internalize that and then you change your nature to fit what you think what your community wants. So one of the things that social media does is lie to you about what your community wants. And it tells you that what the people around you want you to do is to be outraged, to express outrage, to identify in-groups and out-groups, divide the world between them, get really mad at the out-groups because those are the things the platforms artificially promote. You see that, you think that's what the people around you want. It's not, but you internalize that and then you express it yourself. So is all of this just kind of an intractable problem of social media? Like I think mm -hmm. your, your framing of sort of capitalizing on frailties is a good one, right? Because I mm -hmm. think another of these sort of complicated and unanswerable questions about this is, to what extent was this deliberate, right? And I think the sure. the idea that like Mark Zuckerberg sort of sat in his Harvard dorm room and is like, you know what I'm gonna do is destroy <laughs> world democracy. Like I don't think of that's course. true. Right, 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 uh, right. But I also think it's, I, I can sort of see the series of small steps where mm. you say, okay, how do we give people this like small dopamine hit that is a like that makes it more. And right. so you can, you can see kind of bit by bit how you get there. But what I've come to wonder is like, it, was all of this just a bad idea? Like, is it, mm -hmm. are we, are we, we're entering this really interesting phase, I think, where like Twitter is blowing up, nobody's really on Facebook anymore, Instagram's not that cool, uh, I don't know. It's like, it feels like we're at the end of a, of a phase of this. Right. And part of what I wonder is if we're all gonna look around and be like, oh, we just never should have done this in the first place. Like, this, this sucked. Yeah. Group chats are fine, we'll leave group <laughs> chats. But that's like the most we should be allowed to have at this point. Right. But uh, it does make me wonder, like, is this, it, that, that combination of things, like these human mm -hmm. frailties that we have and these massive connections at these massive scales by big companies that try to make money, it, I just, I run into this thing where it's like, maybe this was just never, ever, ever gonna work in a way that actually works for everybody. 
So, right. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. It's a really small question. It's, it's, really, it's like, a small question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there used to be, and many of us probably remember, a social media that did not do a lot of this stuff and that did not work like this. Before like 2006, 2007, social media did not have any of these engagement maximizing features. And sure enough, basically all of the problems that we now associate with social media, I wasn't going to say there were not on them, but it was much more kind of what we used to think social media might be, which is that it exacerbates the good and the bad alike, but it was a much more neutral. If you're about to part. tell me a story about how good MySpace was, first of all, <laughs> I'm, I'm very here for it. Second of all, that is dangerous territory. <laughs> I'm being paid by Microsoft. So that's why I'm a Microsoft paid MySpace shell. We're bringing it back. Um, every platform arrived at two tools because it's what works. One is maximizing for engagement, and there are lots of ways you can do that. Algorithms are the things that everybody points to, but there's all sorts of ways that that is built into the platforms. And the second is artificially forcing you into much larger communities that you'd might, you would rather be in. And this actually used to be a big problem in Silicon Valley, is people would get on social networks, and they would naturally coalesce in groups of about 100, 150 people, and they quickly learned to force us into much, much larger groups because that's better for engagement, heightens the impulses. These are the two things that over and over, regardless of the platform, we see cause the exact same problems every single time. And in some ways makes it easier to, or it makes me at least think, you know, Facebook's policies or who's in charge of Twitter or what are YouTube's rules, all of these are kind of secondary because we know that a modern social media network is built around these two ideas and we know that at the scale that they operate at that they produce the exact same thing over and over again. Now the question of um, did they know? You want me to tackle that? Sure. Or was it, was it deliberate? I think there are two ways to ask that. One is did they know at the outset what they were doing, what they were getting us into. And I think the second is in the kind of current, you know, like post-2015, post-2016 social media runs everything world, do they actively know now what they're doing? And I think the answers to both of those is a caveated yes, but it's a different caveated yes. Okay. I would also add a third to that, by the way, which is should they have known? Which I think is, is an know. interesting question that yeah. you spend some time on in the book is these questions of basically like, w we ended up in this place where like this specific kind of person was valued by tech people. That person made a lot of money making a tech company, became right. a venture capitalist, funded right. people who looked like them right. and thought like them, and it just perpetuated forever. And so like, it, I remember when you know Facebook came out and was like, oh, we didn't know we had any effect on politics. And it's like, well, A, I don't know if I believe you, and B, right. you really, really super should have. <laughs> and, and so I think that's, that's the third thing I would add, is right. like, is this, do they bear responsibility even if they didn't know? Well, what, I, what was fascinating to me going into this, and I was, I was going into it thinking, I'm going to have to do all of this reporting to try to figure out, like, what did they know? What were the early conversations within the companies? And can I get, like, documents? Can I get some kind of internal paperwork? And it, it, it turns out that early on in social media, early on in the social media era in Silicon Valley, it was an absolutely out in the open discussed thing. We are going to change human behavior. We're going to do it deliberately, and we're going to use humanity's psychological weaknesses to do it. There were conferences that they would hold in Silicon Valley where they would get together with people who had worked with psychologists to uh, come up with the what they would call cognitive hacks uh, for changing people's behavior to get them to spend more time on the products. Because they knew that social media is not like other products. You're not selling somebody something. You're not saying, you know, give me $10 and then I'll give you this and then I hope you'll come back and buy more. You're saying what you want is to glue people to a screen for as long as possible. That's it. That's the whole conceit. So what you're doing is you're trying to addict them. And um, Nir Eyal wrote this book. I can't remember what it's called. Do you remember what it's called? I believe it's called Hooked. Hooked, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of on so, the nose in retrospect, so, but yeah. So brazen. <laughs> um, he was a consultant for a lot of these companies, and people like him were consultants for these companies. So you see what I mean, where it was out in the open. And he would talk about very openly at these conferences in this book, this idea that you want to develop your platforms like a slot machine to be addictive. And even more than that, what you want to do, what you want to addict them with is you want to give them the simulacrum of the experience of uh, social interaction with people who you love. These are his words. 
you want to let people think that they are having that social interaction, which is a fundamental human need. We literally need it to survive. And that what you want to give them instead is these flashing lights, this you know haptic feedback from their phone vibrating. You want to give them the sensory experience of a little dopamine hit that will stand in place of a meaningful social engagement. And they will learn to chase that dopamine hit whenever they want to have some kind of social interaction, whenever they want to have uh, affection from someone, whenever they want to experience love, that they will instead come to your platform, that they will chase likes, which do not give them that feeling, but will give them the dopamine boost that will make them come back a time and time again. This is something that was openly talked about 15 years ago in Silicon Valley that they the wanted to do. Gamification was like the word of the day for right. years. And it was like, right. how do we make this more addicting? And it all seemed very low stakes right. at the time. Yeah, and right, right. It's, it's very clear that it wasn't back then. Right. And the, and the uh, Stanford School, the Persuasion Tech Lab, That's right. where the per persuasion is a business term of art that means changing people's behavior to use your product more. They, they've changed the name of the school at the Stanford. They realized they shouldn't call it the Persuasive Tech Lab. Um, but right, I mean, I think that's the, at the outset, they knew what they were doing. They didn't know what the consequences were going to be because they did not appreciate the scale of it. Um, there was a lot of talk about Mark Zuckerberg used to say we are rewiring humanity from the ground up, which sure sounds like some grand ambitions to me. Um, but what they did not think through, because a lot of them were young people with technical backgrounds, did not have a psychological background, was what specific impulses they were going to tap into and promote. But by the time the consequences of this start becoming apparent in the world, the, they, all of the research is out there to know. And in fact, you had a lot of psychologists, a lot of people who did study this were banging on the doors of these companies trying to warn them. And what we now know from people like Francis Haugen for who are leaking internal documents is their own internal researchers were telling them these products are harmful, their core nature is harmful, and that we are tapping into people's basic natures and their underlying instincts in a way that is turning against each other and harmful for society. They're also tremendously successful and profitable. Exactly, which right. is which is like the, the sort of fundamental tension. Actually, let's let's get into that. So I should have said this at the beginning, but we're going to take some questions in a few minutes. Uh, there's going to be microphones floating around. Um, so if you have questions about you know the future of the internet and why we're all so bad at it, uh, please ask them. But I do want to talk for a few minutes about what better looks like here, right? Like if we if we go past the premise that social media was a bad idea and we should just all run away from it as fast as possible. Um, which I think even if it's true is like not practical to the world that we live mm, in. Right. Um, I think to me it seems like the two big tensions right now are that the metrics have been engagement and growth forever. And as long as you chase those two things, you're gonna keep making what amounts to the same set of decisions. And that these are big companies that ultimately like have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. And it turns out when like Mark Zuckerberg says, I don't want to do social media. I want to like not give people legs in the metaverse. Uh, <laughs> it goes really badly. Right. And so I guess as, as you've been thinking about this, like is there, is there a path toward better? Like if everybody just sort of woke up tomorrow and decided we want to do within reason what is, mm -hmm. what is better. What does that even look like? Right, it's it's a really it's a harder question than you might think because even if I mean it's very easy to say oh it's just that the people who you know Mark Zuckerberg is a bad guy the people who run Twitter or YouTube are bad people and if they were nicer and if they understood the harm they were doing then social media would be great but it is like you said it's fundamentally these are for profit companies and the way that they make money is by maximizing engagement that's what the product is. And it's really hard to engineer that out without, you know, saying, by the way, we're also going to fix all of capitalism because it's basically that's, you know. <laughs> so we're bringing back MySpace, but we're nationalizing it. That's right. <laughs> that's right. In the socialist MySpace utopia, <laughs> yeah. that's right, that we are getting ready okay, for. Good, good. It's going to be huge. Um, so I have heard a lot from people since the book came out, especially I live in Washington, D.C. I mean, we both live in Washington, D.C. I've heard a lot from people in Congress and lawmakers and their staffs, regulators, who are trying to figure out what do we do about this. And there are basically two schools of thought. The first school of thought are, is um, identifying some set of regulatory rules or uh, standards that can be enforced on the companies to try to create systems that will maximize engagement because that's just what social media is always gonna be built to do, but in a way that has much tighter safeguards, that has healthier 
uh, and that does not promote as much of the bad stuff. And the other school of thought, which I think is um, the one that is prevailing now or that is coming to prevail, is a view that basically says these are the cigarette companies. Uh, their product is innately, at its core, addictive, and it is innately, at its core, harmful, and that you can't, you can't have a healthy cigarette and you cannot have a social media platform that is not bringing out our worst impulses. So if you start from that premise that these are the cigarette companies, and then the regulatory approach does not become about, you know, how do we maximize for engagement to get a trillion clicks a day, but we do it in a nice way, but rather how do we interrupt people's relationships to this product, which is ultimately, I mean, you know, we've been trying to regulate cigarettes for 60 years, and it's been a very slow process of getting people to smoke less, and cigarettes are still out there. Yeah, I think it was, uh Chris Saka, the venture capitalist, who was uh, tweeting, ironically, the other day about how now that Twitter is sort of collapsing in on itself like a dying star, um, that it, he's sort of facing this question that it's like if, you're, if the company who made the cigarettes you've been smoking forever goes out of business, do you go find another cigarette that you like a little less but still does it, or do you quit smoking? And it's like, I just thought that was such a striking version of it. And I think a lot of people, I've found myself recently looking around being like, okay, I'd like something that feels better than all of this. Right. Uh, but I still like the thing where I get to talk to lots of people and I get to find new information and I get to communicate with large groups of people and yeah. see what everybody's up to. And it, it, those two things increasingly feel mutually exclusive in right. a way that I think is real, but also honestly kind of makes me sad. Like yeah. there are good things about this stuff. Yeah. And if, if it is true that the bad outweighs the good, which it increasingly seems to be true in a lot of ways, so be it. But it is, it is slightly disheartening to not have there be a middle ground that feels like it works. Well, I get asked a lot by people, you know, okay, so does this mean that I should throw my smartphone in the river? And um, I, I don't think you should do that. Flip and I phones for everybody, man. That's the only way. <laughs> Flip phones. Bring them <laughs> back. Phones. Man, you've really got, you've got like a whole vision for our, our flip phone, MySpace, It just, it turns out we got technology right in 2003, and we yeah. should just go back. It, that's just, that's where I land here. I, I we think that's, I think there's actually something to that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I am on social media. You can to exist in today's world, you kind of have to be on social media. You know, it would be, it would be nice to say like, yeah, get rid of your smartphone and go live in a cabin in the woods and be a Buddhist monk. And like, if you can do that, God bless. That sounds great. But the advice that I find myself giving a lot to people because it is what I, at some point when I was working on this book, realized I myself had arrived at, is to just start treating social media more like a drug because that's what it is. It is a drug in that it's addictive, it's a drug in that it changes your behavior, it changes your mood, and um, drugs are something that are part of almost all of our everyday lives. And I don't just mean that, you know, we're all doing cocaine all the day, but I mean in the sense that, you know, I had a cup of coffee this morning, I'm probably gonna have a glass of wine tonight. I understand that both of those are drugs and I moderate and regulate how I use them, understand that they affect my behavior. Um, as fun as it might have been, I did not have three beers before coming out here because I understood that that would change my behaviors in ways that would be detrimental to my experience and probably to all of your experiences too. And I think that a lot of us are starting to come around to seeing social media the same way, that uh, you try to be really careful about when you open it, you try to be really careful about when you use it. Uh, it's easy to say don't get your news from social media, it's something that we all kind of know, but I do think that when I found myself regulating my behavior to it in a way that has actually, actually changed how I feel, and I actually do feel that since I really put myself on a social media diet, I can feel myself, my underlying emotional state changing. It is much deeper about you know giving myself three times a day when I open it and really try to make that it and try to not post on it or be very intentional about posting on it. And there's whole schools of thought about how to regulate your approach. But I think when you start to see it as a, as a drug that you take 30 times a day, it starts to uh, open up some possibilities in how you approach it. Okay, I like that. Um, and we're gonna take questions in just one second. I think there are microphones starting to float around. Um, but my last question for you is, we talk a lot about in all of these contexts about like politics and, and news. And I think for you and I, people who are in the news business, we think about this stuff all the time, so it, it, it's sort of, it's our world. But it's not 
everyone's, right? And so I guess as you think about this stuff, does it, do the same sort of rules and problems apply? Do you think, like, are you looking around and it's like, oh, Bulls and Bucks fans, like, more polarized than ever, and that's a big problem? <laughs> Um, or is it is it sort of confined to this one obviously very high stakes but also very sort of specific visible part of right. social media right it's a great question and there are ways that these mechanisms can be turned towards good um, I mean the me too movement would not have happened without social media not just as an organizing platform but the fact that it so drastically amplifies expressions of outrage, you know, that's a case where those expressions are deserved and correct and where amplifying them was really positive. Um, probably the same for Black Lives Matter, maybe not quite to the same extent because there's obviously a lot of grassroots organizing there too, but social media has had a pretty important role in it. You do see over the, the broad view in general, um, pretty much any kind of community that organizes online and specifically on a modern social network, on a Facebook group, on a, on a Twitter circle, that it's prone to these same tendencies of, um, and you can see this, if you see this get in any discussion online, that it will inevitably turn towards, we're all mad at something or we're all mad at somebody. There's a group that's us, there's a group that's them, and we don't like that group that is them, that is the out group, and this sense of kind of galvanizing around, you know, whatever it is. So I, I think it is worth being careful, even if it's just, you know, your local knitting group. And in fact, there are, um, I know we have to get to questions, so I won't dive into a full <laughs> story, but the, one of the things I talk about in the book is there's a lot of um, rural villages around the world that used Facebook groups starting about six, seven years ago to organize basically their first community bulletin boards. And these were some of the first progenitors of what we now know as the QAnon conspiracy of these hateful rumors that led people to go out and act in you know crazy ways and commit this violence just because bringing people together in that forum that maximize these certain instincts and emotions just points in a direction. Okay. All right. Well, I have a million more questions for you, but let's take some questions out here. So I think there there may be microphones. I'm not exactly sure how this works. So if this goes horribly wrong, uh, I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think if you have a question, just raise your hand and, we, and we've got some, some microphones running around here. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm curious when you talk about the anti-vaxxers, was that a, a rumor, the anti-vax, that a company actually started or did somebody just say it on social media and it spread? I'm, I'm curious whether there are these sort of false rumors or whatever, conspiracy theories are actually started by the companies to get more people or are they started by individuals on the platforms? So I'm, I'm glad you asked that because anti-vaccine sentiment is, it's one of the ways it's an interesting test case is the companies are actually very opposed to it. And they, I mean, first of all, it's such a small part of what's on the platforms. They don't really make any money off of it. And second of all, it's something that Mark Zuckerberg in particular, you know, because of what his wife does, because he's, he, uh, of his involvement in the local hospital in San Francisco it was something that he was very opposed to and that he went out of his way to try to suppress on the site, or not suppress, to a problem he tried to solve and the platforms tried to solve because it's so abhorrent and because they are so opposed to spreading anti-vaccine sentiment. It's something that arose, I wouldn't say exactly organically, uh, but almost every form of malicious conspiracy, rumor, hate group that appears on social media. What will happen is someone will express it and the automated systems that run the platforms will identify it as something that is going to be especially engaging to people and then we'll learn over doing these little test runs of iterating of trying to promote it to people that it is especially engaging and we'll promote it out more and more. But um, no, in this case, there was there's no one who uh, thought, yes, let's let's undermine uh, vaccine usage. Uh, all right, who's next? I think over here. Hi, thanks. Hello, okay. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you think social media has changed journalism? So not talking about fake news, but more about how a lot of news outlets are also on social media and Twitter is like a key platform for journalists and journalism as an industry is monetized in a lot of the same ways as social media. So I was wondering if you think that something has changed in the industry related to the issues that we've been talking about social media with like moral outrage. Oh boy. I know. I know. Oh, I know. oh boy. We have six hours, right? Yeah, right. This yeah. is cancel everything you had going for the rest of the weekend. 
Uh, you you want to take this one first? I have some thoughts, but you can I you bet go you first. do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. So uh, we, as an industry, and, and I, I implicate myself in this 100%, um, when social media first started to get really, really big in its reach around 2011, 2012, 2013, um, we realized that this is a way to reach a ton of people. And we realized that if you write your headlines in a certain way that um, the Facebook algorithm likes or that will spread well on Twitter, or that will do well in certain groups on Reddit, that will do well on certain subreddits, that you can reach, instead of the 7,000 people you might normally reach, 70,000 or 700,000. And one of the things you believe as a journalist is that you have something that you think would be helpful for people to know, so you want people to get that message. It's really important to you to reach as many people as you can with the work that you've done. Um, people get overly cynical about this and they think, oh, it's because they want page views. As a reporter, we do not get paid based on page views. All of that ad money does not go to us, it goes to our bosses. What we want to do is we want to reach people with our articles because we think that matters. So it's you start to write towards that. And at some point, I think a lot of us started to realize that, that boy, Facebook's algorithm really likes outrage. They really like it when you say that Republicans are bad. They really like it when you know, you're really dunking on someone and you're expressing a lot of outrage or, you know, um, we were scrupulous about it within what we understood to be the ethical balance of journalism, but a lot of people were not. Um, this is when you get sites like Breitbart, as people who say we really take off the guardrails ethically, we really just post whatever's gonna do super well on Facebook, on Twitter, and that's what did super well. Um, well, Did and that, that cycle works the it, it sort of in the other direction as well, right? Like it's it's the sort of running joke in the media business that Twitter is the assigning editor for every newsroom in America, right. yeah. and it's super real. And I think it, it goes back to a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Is like it is very much kind of a learned behavior mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. this is what people are interested in, and often it's just twelve very loud people on the internet who are interested in it. But it's really easy to perceive that as like mm -hmm. this matters, and thus I have to. I have to pursue it. And then you do that and people respond to it. Mm -hmm. And you you sort of you're constantly calibrating what you're doing based on what people are responding to. And it's often I found in my own case it, unintentional, but it just mm -hmm. it just happens. And you look at it and it's like, okay, one metric of success is like if I get lots of retweets, mm -hmm. I did it. Something mm -hmm. like uh, that's success. And it's not. Like that is not an actual metric of anything. Um, but it has, I think, it, it has warped the way a lot of us think about right. kind of what matters and what we should be talking about. Right. One, just to add a caveat, one positive thing that it's done is, uh, and this is something that has been written about a lot, is that it uh, allowed communities who might not normally have a proportional voice in the media to basically force their way onto the agenda. And I think that that has been a good thing. And here again, I'm thinking about Me Too, I'm thinking about Black Lives Matter. Um, so it's definitely not all bad. Some of the effects, I think, have been really positive. Totally. All right, yeah, again, we could talk about this for hours, and uh, I'm very happy to, but we should move on. Uh, who's next? I think, I don't know where the microphone went. Um, it's somewhere. Whoever has a microphone, just start yelling. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hi. Um, as somebody that's been very po positive about the internet, the internet, not so much uh, social media, but the capacity to uh, interact with people around the world and teach people around the world, I think it's not just the Me Too movement, but I, I think it's been a real positive force. Obviously, pe human beings are gravitate towards adversarial relationships, which you're calling outrage. I mean, that's people like to watch competition. Um, you made that joke about we're here not instead of watching football, but uh, and I think that outrage that makes sense in terms of outrage and the addictive qualities of uh, I got that. What I'm most concerned about is not so much adversarial relationships, say, in politics. I mean, even around uh, vaccines. I'm a, I'm a physician, so, you know, that was very upsetting that there was all this uh, misinformation about vaccine, vaccinations that caused millions of deaths in, around the world lately, not just with uh, earlier stuff. But um, what, so people are always going to fight it out and be attracted to fights. The problem that I would like you to talk about is the fake news. And what do we do about that? Because it's, you know, it's like that old quote with Moynihan, you know, it's like you're entitled 
to uh, not to your, the facts. You're entitled to your opinions arguing about the facts. Seems to me that's a huge problem that's been amplified by social media. Could you, I know that's a big topic, but I'd love to hear. Topic. So it's, it's, the, it's the same problem. Um, false information, rumors, conspiracy, deliberate disinformation, they don't spread because they're false. They spread because they tap into those same impulses of us versus them, because they tap into a sense of moral outrage, uh, and not that they necessarily do, but when they tap into that sense of moral outrage, that is something that not just, it's that it travels more on social media, but we know from tons of social science research that when you activate that sense in people's brains of outrage, of tribalism, of us versus them, that people, and this is all of us, respond first with social instincts, and they're the, the, literally the reasoning part of our brain does not activate. Literally the social instincts part of our brain is what activates and tells us to go along and to believe it, and then only after that does our brain process the information and then make it true, and that is how, it's easy to say when you see people believing disinformation, misinformation online, that it's like, oh, it's because they're not smart enough, they're not smart like me, I would I know how to identify it, but we all have this frailty, and because social media is amplifying these instincts, putting this in this particular context is an environment in which false information, as long as it's designed to hammer onto that, can spread really, really effectively. So who's next? Thank you. Um, so uh, my, my, my question is about uh, like the, the emergent phenomenon of a uh, platform like Be Real and, and, and sort of maybe how that, um, and also uh, decentralized social media platforms, uh, maybe how that can sort of pose an alternative to the, the, the sort of the incentive structure of the dopamine uh, kind of trigger that you, will, that you were talking about with, with Facebook and, and, and TikTok and sort of maybe the, the contrast for an alternative to that model. Yeah, the, it's definitely possible to design a nice social network, um, but it's nice because it doesn't maximize for engagement, and because it doesn't maximize for engagement, people don't spend time on it, it doesn't make money, or it doesn't make nearly as much money, and it just it can't be competitive in the market. I mean, it's, it's putting out a cigarette that instead of having nicotine in it has I don't know, wood chips. Like it's just, it's a nicer cigarette, but then why would you even buy the cigarette? Right. I do think that we're, we're headed to, and I think Be Real is a good example of this actually, and for anyone who doesn't know, Be Real is basically this app that you get a notification once a day uh, at a random time, and it gives you two minutes to take a picture, and it takes a picture of you and whatever you're looking at, and then it shares that picture with your friends, and you can't get, you can't see what your friends have posted until you also post. Um, there is no version of that that is like as big as Facebook, right? They're just, it just, I just, there's just no way that becomes so because it is like deliberately less interesting. But I think we're heading into this really cool place where we're gonna get to try a lot of intentionally less interesting things because it turns out that I think we like way overshot what all of this could be, right? And I think what what is now gonna happen is this pendulum is gonna swing back to like, okay, how do we connect with people? How do we find people who care about the things that we care about? How do we get back to some of the stuff that really works about the internet that's great about social media without making it so, like, I think a trillion dollar social network is just a bad idea, right? And I think we have learned this in a number of ways now, but I think these other things we're gonna get to try, I think are actually, to me, super exciting. That's a much nicer answer than mine. I think I was a little, <laughs> I was a little glib about it, I'm sorry. It's, you're right, you're right. There are interesting things you can do, and if people choose them, and a lot of people are choosing them, there's no reason that's not viable. And you, I think you alluded to one of the like, low-key, hottest social networks right now, which is the group chat. The group chat is back in a big way because you can get that fix of social interaction, of connecting with people 10 times a day, but it's not, it's not as harmful and it doesn't make you feel bad in the way that being on a modern social network does. I'm on group chats all the time now. It's actually, it's a great nicotine patch for weaning yourself off of Facebook totally. or Twitter. I agree. Um, all right, I think we probably have time for maybe one, one or two more. One more question, and one then just a question. reminder, there is a book signing upstairs for anyone who is interested. If you would like to purchase a book, they're available just outside these doors. But yes, one final question, right here. Thank you. I, you uh, as denizens of DC, um, you mentioned this idea of regulation, and the cigarette analogy is interesting because you know there's kind of two general ways to go. You just prohibit something by law, or the other tool, since we're talking about things that make money, is to tax the hell out of it. 
Is taxing social media the way we tax cigarettes to make the purchase of them painful a, a way to possibly go? Every time you log on, there's a little sticker that says Facebook makes you mad. <laughs> And um, it just takes $13 out of your bank account. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And that goes to us, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, right, it's hard to find the one-to-one. -one. And there's uh, this conversation in D.C. among the people who are actually going to be tasked with if this ever happens, bring it about. It's very early, and they know it's very early. And looking for the similarity, partly it's about fines, and indeed there have been some mammoth fines, but what actually reduced people's access to cigarettes and use of it, and you alluded to this, was not really big fines on the company, which they were happy to pay and then continue to make money, but to make it harder to get a hold of cigarettes, to limit children's access to them. And social media and children is actually it's very similar to children and cigarettes, and that the addictiveness of social media is really heightened for kids because they have more of a need for socialization and all the effects, positive and negative, are heightened for kids. And there's some discussion about, you know, should kids just not be on social media? How do you bring that about? Should we just make it harder to get on the platforms the way that we make it harder to smoke? Or is it more about social stigma? And the social stigma around smoking is really, really high, and it took 50 years to create, but it is probably saved untold millions of lives that you get a little bit of a dirty look if you light up. So I don't know what the one-to-one -one is for Facebook or Twitter or if that one-to-one, -one, whatever it is, is the right way to go or would be appropriate, but I know that it is something that is getting a lot of discussion right now. Awesome, all right, well thank all of you for being here. Max, thank you so much. This was extremely fun. Thank you.